Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name <coughs> through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how, they see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, there's already a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I, know, I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be gracious and pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. In fall 2003, I moved to St. Paul, Minnesota to begin theological studies at Luther Seminary. And it was a jarring turn from the long-expected trajectory of my life. I'd taken pre-medicine courses throughout college and expected life as a physician, diagnosing, healing, and preferably managing the bulk of time spent with patients under anesthesia. Great to see you. Here, have a nap. <laughs> and then we could solve the physical problems du jour. But I'd rather accidentally happen into a few religion and philosophy courses, and it's a story in and of itself, but needless to say, I was captivated. So after graduating with majors in religion and philosophy, I decided on a two-year hiatus to study systematic theology before heading off to medical school. And when I told my Jewish mother about my plans, she said, honey, I understand you like Jesus, but do you have to take it this far? Truthfully, it wasn't really about Jesus at that point, like it is now. It was the whole enthralling theological enterprise, what people believe and why it matters. I mean, the truth is, everybody believes something. Even the most fervent atheist and committed agnostic has a system of belief, a way of being and practice in the world, regardless of whether it fits in, into any one particular tradition. So there I was in seminary, up in St. Paul, and by mid-November I was met with a particularly new and difficult challenge to my own long-held beliefs. I'd been hired to work in the admissions office under the supervision of one Ms. Sandy Hammerland, among the world's finer Norwegian Americans. And there was a particularly early, particularly large snowstorm one November day a day when I had been expected to arrive at the office around 8.30 a.m. But with the snow and the roadblocks and the unplowed sidewalks, naturally there'd be a snow day off for everyone involved until 9 o'clock a.m. when Sandy Hammerlin called to ask me where I was. I'm home. It's a snow day, Sandy. Haven't you looked outside yet? Yes, from my office window. You live in Minnesota now. See you soon. <laughs> I had to grieve the loss of a snow day. There is rarely, if ever, such a thing like that in that part of the world. There is hardly the magic of a snow day off from school or work or anything in between. Perhaps you remember, if anything like me, as a child, you turn your pajamas inside out and you dance in the living room to conjure the will of the weather system for a few bus-stopping inches of the white stuff. And perhaps, much to my embarrassment, I was having such dreams and practices even so far as my senior year in college. In, De in Jennifer Berenson's Greek class, wishing for a snow day to postpone the midterms for just another 48 hours to get those verb declensions just right, but to no avail, it was 24 hours late. Our gospel today meets Jesus on an unexpected, passed over snow day, on a road less traveled, on a day when no one seemed to have it together or get it right, when everything and everyone seemed to have turned left rather than right. Jesus arrived at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. Now Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, were especially close friends of Jesus, who knew that Jesus had been busy for us some time, exercising power over struggle and illness and darkness and despair. But apparently Jesus had been more than a little late to manage Lazarus' illness and, appending, and impending demise. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's Mary's plea as much as it's an accusation. Mary believed that life was going to take a certain trajectory and her brother's death was probably not part of that plan. She probably thought that the future had goodness and family and meals together and maybe some snow days 
but with this hard turn, it was going to be a future without her brother. So she bitterly addressed her Lord. Where were you? Where were you when he became sick? When he took a turn for the worse and then he died? You've been four days slow to visit. Don't think for a second that everyone that we read about in the Bible speaks as though we read it. Very genteel and very cautiously and reverently. She was sticking a finger in Jesus' chest and saying, no. And Jesus, rather than delivering up an explanation about the new world order or waxing theological about God's ways with death and life, he wept. Our story says he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He wept. And I and most of you probably understand why. There are so many reasons to weep at a bedside, or at a funeral, or a wake. One of the things you learn at seminary is how on the job and by happenstance to keep your tears to yourself. You bite on the soft inside portion of your cheek or dig a pinky nail into your palms so that way you allow the tears to come from the people in front of you while you stand solid like a rock. But the truth is, particularly as a pastor, you love the people that you serve. And you love the people that love the people that you serve. So when anything as small as a skin knee or passed over promotion happens, or the diagnosis comes back, or the final Eucharist circles at a hospital bed, or the family needs to choose between certain caskets and times for the funeral, it's exceedingly hard to stifle and choke the tears back even and especially when you know God will do something about this whole death situation. But even more so, even and especially when you know God could do something different right then and there. The crowd in the gospel is right when they say, see how he loved him. And then in the next breath, sort of murmured off to the side, couldn't the same guy who saved all sorts of other people's skin save the life of his friend? Every pastor gets it. Every pastor has cried it. In this, every pastor and every parishioner understands Jesus' tears. He does have a firm grasp on humanity, after all. The scene in the story then moves from meeting together at the house and talking about the death to moving in front of the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it, the story explains. It's not a minor detail. It's another way of Again, noting the finality of death. Like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, that big stone is there to say nothing goes in, nothing comes out. But Jesus makes an announcement to the contrary. Take away the stone. And at that, Martha, Lazarus' other sister, gives her own sermon, meant to be heard with some edge of humor. He's been dead four days. He stinks says the text, or as the King James Version so eloquently puts it, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> she knew how this would go. Like when I'd said to Sandy Hammerland all those years ago on that purported snow day, Martha said to Jesus, it's dead day, Jesus. Haven't you seen the stone? Well, yes, but like Sandy, Jesus dished up a different way to look at the situation. Yes, I know, Martha, but let's not forget you live in God's kingdom. You live in God's good creation. You live in God's grace and with God's peace and with God's promise. Move the stone. Martha and Mary know something about grief. It stinks. Grief is the deep pain of love lost and absences at tables. Death stinks. The end of life so often feels like and often is the end of everything as we know it. It's the rotten receipt of life well lived and people well loved. And what we hear in this story is that even here where it stinks, Jesus is there. The one who sang the song of creation at the beginning, drawing forth all good things from the earth, from the hummus, and breathed life into all of it, Good, 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 good. And then when he came to the creation of humanity, very good. 
The same one who kept the feet of God's people in the wilderness plodding along until they reached their promised place. The same one who is not there to hide but to reveal. Our reading from Revelation sounds the alarm about what to expect from him. See, the home of God is among mortals, and he will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Remember, the title of the book where that comes from is Revelation. Despite what you may have heard, its words are not trying to hide something cryptic and unsure about God's dealings with the world. It's revelation. God revealing the ways of God with humanity and with Lazarus, with Mary and Martha, with you. The vision tells us that the home of God is among mortals, meaning God chooses to get God's hands dirty, to get dirt under God's fingernails, to live among creatures who live by God's grace and die in God's peace. He is with us in life and in death and calls forth a time when crying and death will end. And here's the key. Here's the key to what God is saying in Revelation. And here's the key to that whole story about Lazarus and Jesus raising him from death. It's that death isn't natural. Just like venturing out green in, deep foot, in foot deep snow isn't natural when you live in Minnesota. Just like my hard left turn from medicine to theology was unexpected. Death isn't natural. We like to say that it is. You're born, you live, you die. That's just the way things go. But our stories today communicate that death is not natural. The entire story of scripture means to tell you as much, pointing out how God spends much of God's time planning and rescuing and announcing God's deliverance from everything unexpected and grievous and deadly and death-dealing in the world. And on this All Saints Day, we recognize that those whom we've loved have returned. We recognize that those whom we've loved who have indeed returned to dust will not stay in such a state because God wills it. God will destroy the shroud that is cast over all people, swallowing up death forever. And because of this, we don't need to imagine a pie in the sky in the sweet by and by, where someday we'll meet our beloved dead in some imaginary faraway cruise ship up there. This gospel story today is a sweet foretaste of Jesus coming into our present moment, raising new life on earth as it is in heaven. It is part of Christ's promise that wraps us into the life-giving flow of God's good creation. And let's be clear, for as often as we talk about these mighty things of faith in the church, the on-the-ground truth is baked into the cake of our practice from week to week. I was reminded of this last week at my daughter's Girl Scout troop meeting. We ended with a song that you might be familiar with. Join me if you know it. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. But do you know the last verse? The circle's round, it has no end. That's how long I want to be your friend. The circle, the sign of persistence and everlasting presence, alpha and omega without beginning or end. And we have a similar song that we practice in our churches. It is no coincidence that beginning today, we're going to begin all of us returning to this altar for Holy Communion. Because reminiscent of that pleasant old Girl Scout song, the altar rail is also meant to be a circle. A circle of friendship, of hope, of love, and especially of promise. Let me tell you what I mean. How many of you have ever seen a church with a graveyard attached to it? Much of the time, architecturally, that, grave side, that graveyard is built on the side opposite of the wall where the altar and the altar rail are located. And the idea is that the circle made on this side, that this is only half the circle. When we receive Holy Communion, the rest of the circle is made complete on the other side. 
in that graveyard where there is nothing that keeps us apart from sharing this holy table with our beloved who have gone before us. They kneel numinously opposite of us on the other side, being fed and made whole by the same God who feeds and gives you life today. We return to this rail to be made whole from all the wonky turns and hard paths we have walked that have fractured or surprised or aggrieved us all. We return here to be made whole along with Lazarus and Mary and Martha and all the rest that God has seen fit to make whole. When we receive Holy Communion, we participate in a radical act of trust that God is showing up with the truth about death, that it's not natural. Because our God is above all in the business of making life. It's a surprise. It goes against everything that we and those people wailing at Lazarus' grave expect, that what we see is not what will be. And this truth brushes up hard against my mother's words those years ago. I understand you like Jesus, but do you have to take it this far? Well, yes, because Jesus is going to take it even farther. Even when it seems like the natural order of things is to take the snow day off, even when it seems like when someone dies, we're supposed to just grieve for a little bit and then get on with it, we have a God who refuses either. On this All Saints Day, rest in the promise that Christ Jesus' death has met its end, and life is what you have coming to you and to those you have loved. At the very end of our gospel story, Lazarus walked out of his grave, and Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. May we all be unbound from our fears about death and walk in the ways of God's standing and immutable promise of everlasting life now and for the life of the world to come. Death is not natural. Life is what we have coming to us. And if all goes well, a few snow days. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. With him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people are found in your bulletin. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, 
for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, and friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Ketlin, our bishop-elect, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, For Nacho, Mark, preschooler Nico, baby brother, and surrogate Katie. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, O Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We especially remember for, before you today. Adelaide and Jim Ambrose, Yolanda Barber, Dorothy Bardell, Paul Bardell, Adelaide and Lee Barnes, Alvin and Elma Burley, Salvatore Camerlingo, Barbara Hurley, Oswald DePaul, Martha DePaul, Richard DePaul, Judy DePaul, Lucy and Marianne in Arena, Ross and Mar Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them, 
who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of your sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and your glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you know the needs of your church in every place. Look graciously upon us, the people of the Church of the Redeemer, and grant us the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we seek a new rector for this parish. Give us discernment, wisdom, and confidence in your timing. Guide the members of our search committee as they labor to be faithful in seeking your will. We pray for the life of our parish that we may continue to be strengthened in our mission to be Jesus Christ's heart, hands, and feet to our neighbors, no matter where, they are on their journey of faith. Bless us with mutual trust and respect, courage and foresight as you shepherd our community through its journey. All this we ask as we walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share the peace. And also with you. God's peace. God's peace, everyone. God's peace, peace everyone. everyone. Good morning, everyone. Happy All Saints Day. Um, so welcome to those of you who are visiting with us, those of you who are with us for the first time, and those of you who are with us in person for the first time in some while after you've been online. We also want to say hello to those who are with us online. So if everyone can turn and greet everyone in the camera. Good morning. We have just one imperative announcement. We are about to have a new consecrated bishop. Uh, the Reverend Ketlin Solak is going to be consecrated on Saturday, so this upcoming Saturday, November 13th, at a service at Calvary Episcopal Church in East Liberty at 11 o'clock. And we need something from Redeemer. We need a banner bearer. Just kidding, we don't need any, you all can stay home. <laughs> if you would indeed like to come and participate in the service, there is a link in the regular emails that are coming out from, um, from the diocese. You do need a ticket in part because you need to demonstrate proof of vaccination. And so if you would like to go, I think there is still time to sign up and to get a ticket. It is free. Um, but they're just making sure that everyone is registered for the sake of contact tracing and all that good stuff. But I am delighted uh, and I am grateful that all of us will be hopefully there in some capacity to celebrate and welcome Bishop Solak 
uh, into her new role and ministry among us. Are there any other announcements you would like to share for the good of the parish? Well, being that it is the first Sunday of the month, we want to acknowledge birthdays and anniversaries. We have one very special birthday that we're going to save for last. <laughs> Are there any other birthdays that you would like to? So please feel free to come forward. No. <laughs> All right. So we have all of these wonderful birthdays, but we have one especially that is happening today. Tor is 95. <laughs> and before we sing happy birthday, because we just have to do that, are there any anniversaries that we would like to acknowledge as well? Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear everyone, and especially Tor. Happy birthday. I would, I would ask everyone to offer up how old they're going to be, but I'm not sure everyone really wants to do that. <laughs> so let us pray and offer a blessing to all of you in gratitude for your lives and the lives that you've led so far and the lives that God has in front of you. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of your, their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Congratulations. And thank you, Anne. That was very helpful. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
going to invite everyone to come to the altar after the choir has communed. If there's anyone who is not comfortable or unable to come up to the altar, there will be a station at the chancel steps for you to receive as you wish. And as we are now in the practice of doing in the center circle of the communion trays is white grape juice to receive. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly pleasant in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and I myself Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
that life go out and live it abundantly in faith, hope, and love, giving that which God gave first to you, to all others, that they may know life. And may God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and keep you, now and forever. Amen. Amen.